Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back to Miss Lisa's Math and Science Station. Like, share, subscribe. I want 2,000 subscribers. Uh, we're talking about biology today, and we're talking about chapter seven in this book, Glencoe Biology and Everyday Experience. But if you like the way I explain things, you're welcome to join us. And this is a class primarily designed for homeschoolers, but anybody can watch these videos. Um, and what we're going to be talking about today is simple animals. This part of the book is, and we did last video, we talked about introduction to plants. This is an introduction to simple animals. So we're going to be talking about that. Now, in your book, if you've got the book, you should look. There's a picture on page 132 where it's a picture of a bunch of coral. And if you were just going to guess and had no knowledge, you would guess that those were plants, that they were weird looking plants, but they're actually simple animals. Um, so we're going to be talking about the classification of animals to start with, and then we'll talk about different kinds of simple animals. Now, first of all, what is an animal? Um, animals first of all, cannot make their own food. We are not plants. We cannot turn sunlight into energy. So we are consumers, not producers. All animals consume something else for its food. Most animals cannot can move from place to place. There are some that weirdly can't, but most animals can move. Animals have many cells. Remember that there are things that look like single cell animals, the protozoa, but they're in a different classification because they're a single cell. So animals, by definition, are not protozoa, so they have to have, they're multicellular, okay? Um, next idea is most animals have symmetry, most but not all, and that means that you can cut it in a way where, where the two sides are the same. So our symmetry is this way. You cut me in half, the two sides look very much the same. Some animals have radial symmetry, meaning that they're um, uh, they're alike in a circle. You could get, there's more than one plane of symmetry where you could cut. But these are things that like have tentacles in a circle. You could cut it in many places, and it would still have symmetry. Um, uh, most things do not have where you could cut it in half. Like you could not cut me in half across my belly button and the two sides be the same. In my physics class in their book, they have, they've done that with a Barbie doll. They put a mirror so it's the two halves of the Barbie doll going this way. It's so weird looking. I always look at that going, I don't understand. But anyway, uh, if you're taking my physics class, you can go find the weird Barbie doll picture where she's got a mirror reflecting the wrong way. Um, so that's what an animal is. Now, how are animals classified? You can see that on page 136. And before we do that, I want to review the system of classification. And how you remember it is kings play chess on fine glass sets, which it's kingdom, phylum, um, order, etc., like that. But the one thing we're going to talk about here is the phylum. So phylum is one under kingdom. And, and also... If you watched my last video, I told you how dating things is controversial because it's always changing. Actually, this, this system of classification, some books, depending on what book you have, will change it where there is something above kingdom, where they, they group stuff also. But this is the one that most of the books have. So just know that there's always a scientist out there wanting to make a name for themselves and they'll say, no, we got it wrong. And uh, they'll, they'll, there's, they'll go with their way. All right, so you can see on page 136 that um, plant, that um, chapter animals are classified into nine groups. The most simple are sponges. I know, it's weird, isn't it, that a sponge is an animal, but it is, it's the most simple animal. Um, then there are three phylum, Phyla is the, the plural of worms, three different kinds of worms. And then there are jointed legged animals. And this would be like crayfish, insects, and that's the biggest one. It's got the most um, animals in that classification. There are, animals can be divided into vertebrates and invertebrates. Vertebrates have backbones, invertebrates don't, but those are not the nine groups. 
Um, those are just one way of dividing all of them into two groups. Um, there is a, the most advanced kind of animals are chordates, which means they have spinal cords, they're vertebrates, and they have spinal cords, um, and that's what we're in. We're chordates. We have spinal cords. You, there's also spiny skinned animals. There's soft bodied animals, and there are stinging cell animals like the jellyfish. Have you ever been stung by a jellyfish? I don't think I have. I, I really don't think I have. I've been terrified of jellyfish, and I've maybe been stung. I, like, I remember being at the beach and like, ah, oh, my skin hurts, but I don't think it was a jellyfish. I, it was probably just sand or something. Anyway, I think I would know if I'd been stung for sure. But it, it can be very bad, like even life-threatening. So you got to be careful about that. Um, so the most, so the next, the book talks about the different kinds of animals in order from um, least complex to more complex. And sponges are the least complex. And um, they don't move about freely, despite what SpongeBob does. He is not correct there. Now, SpongeBob is correct on some things, so, but... They, they don't have little legs. They can't walk around and they don't work at the Krusty Krab. But um, how they, but this um, SpongeBob was actually correct on how sponges eat is they can take in water through their pores, their holes, and then blow it out in their filter feeders. So they're in one um, episode, SpongeBob is scared and he's like, I'm just going to stay in this cave. I don't have to eat. I'll just sit here. And he sits down like, like a real sponge and he starts taking in the water and blowing it out. He's like, I'll filter feed. And I'm like, ah, that's actually right. SpongeBob is doing the right thing. Um, uh, so they get the small organisms out of the water and that's their food. They take it in through their pores. You can see a diagram of a sponge on page 138, but it has pores where it takes in. They're sort of hollow on the inside. And then it has an opening where the water goes out the top. Um, uh, in between these two layers, it's sort of jelly-like layer. Um, they have some cells that help make their structure. Their structure is flexible, and that's why we take sponges after they're dead. They'll harvest them, and then we use natural sponges are used for bathing, for washing cars, and things like that. They're expensive. So most sponges you see are not natural sponges. Most of them are synthetic now. But you can still get natural sponges, and I have some. My mom, a long time ago, used to be an artist who ran a... Um, uh, her business was art, and she made pottery for part of her business, and she would use natural sponges in her pottery business in forming the clay. See, that's me doing it. Um, and so I have some natural sponges from her from when they were in her pottery business. And um, it's interesting. It's interesting you can feel the difference between a natural sponge and a synthetic sponge. Um, it feels more natural. Anyway, so um, how they reproduce is sponges have both male, can produce both male and female sex cells, sperm and egg. They, they produce them at different times and they release them into the water. And then the water carries it to a different sponge who takes it in and then uses it for fertilization. So they don't self-fertilize because they make them at different time periods, but they just release it into the water and that is how sponges sexually reproduce. They can also asexually reproduce that if a piece of sponge breaks off, it will grow into a new sponge. It would be like if I could just break off my hand and it grows grow back and grow into a new me like Doctor Who did uh, when it was David Tennant, uh, then that would be asexual reproduction. I guess Doctor Who can asexually reproduce. Didn't think about that. Um, sponges can also reproduce asexually, that means without sex, um, all by themselves, by something called budding. And, and a lot of these simple animals we're going to talk about can do this. And it's where they just start growing out of their side a new organism. It breaks off. And it'd be like if suddenly a baby that was exactly me started growing out of my side and then I could just break it off and there's the baby, the new thing. It's, it's budding. And we're going to look at those. Um, hopefully you will see those under the microscope with um, this week with your labs with Hydra. So um, hopefully you'll be able to do that. And if not, you'll have to look at it on the internet. But um, 
when I teach it, I've got these slides. I always have kids look at the hydrant and the sponge underneath the microscope. So the next group is on page 139. That's where hydra is. It is one of the stinging cell animals. It looks like it's got all these tentacles up top. It's got a mouth, then sort of like at the top of its head. It goes down and it's got a foot that anchors it where it is. Kind of, but hydras, how they can move is they bend over and then do hand, they do handsprings. They'll just go over and go doop, 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 and they can move around where they want to go. They also reproduce by budding. They can have a little baby hydra coming out their side that breaks off and it goes off doing handsprings. Doop, doop, doop. Uh, it's more fun with sound effects. And it has the its mouth where it takes in water. These are aquatic creatures. Gets the nutrients out and then it lets the waste out in the same hole. Think about that. Can you imagine if your mouth and your bottom hole was the same hole? That's what simple animals have. They only have one hole. You should be grateful that you were made with two holes. One for your mouth and one for your waist. <laughs> be thankful for your anus. You just didn't know because there's animals that don't have them. They have one hole and Hydra's one of them. <laughs> the things we talk about in biology class. Um, anyway, so these animals are Hydra, coral, sea fans, jellyfish, sea anemones. Um, they have tentacles. They are arm-like parts. They have mouths that the tentacles go around the mouth. Usually the tentacles help put the food in the mouth. Um, uh, Corals are really a group of animals um, that work together kind of like a colony. The same is true with, with sea fans. Um, uh, a lot of them have radial symmetry. You can cut them in a circle and they're always the same on both sides. Um, they have sac-like bodies made of two cell layers and a jelly-like layer goes in between, a lot like how the sponge was. Um, there's only one way in and out of the body cavity through the mouth. Think about it. Um, let's see. They can catch things with their tentacles. They sting them and then put them in their mouth. Um, uh, some of them have thousands of stinging cells with hair-like triggers. Um, they have poison in them. They can paralyze their food and then take it to their mouth. Um, uh, jellyfish use their muscles to swim. They have muscles and when they contract, it's like let, blowing up a balloon and let go. They squish the water out and they go the other way because of physics for every action. There's an equal and opposite reaction. They squish it, the water out this way. It makes them go forward the other way. Newton's first law of physics. Um, they can reproduce sexually by forming eggs and sperm. Um, so, but these stinging celled um, organisms, but hydra can also reproduce asexually by budding. So um, you are going to look at, now the book has you looking at live hydra where you order them from a biology supply company. Um, I've never gotten live hydra. So I, my, when I teach this, we just look at the dead ones under the microscope with my prepared slides. Um, but they also said that you could use brine shrimp, brine shrimp, or sea monkeys. So that might be fun to go buy some sea monkeys and grow them and look at them under the microscope. That could be really fun for you to do for if you want to do that lab too. The next thing we're going to talk about is worms. And then remember I told you there are three phylum of worm and the first one is tapeworms. Gross. So a tapeworm is this thing. It looks like tape, segmented tape. It can grow very, very long, like many, many, many feet long. It's a parasite in people. You get it from eating uncooked pork. So um, a long time ago, not too long, like maybe 10 years ago, I was watching one of those cooking shows on the Food Network and they said, you really don't have to be so careful about cooking pork anymore. You can have raw pork. And I was like, uh-uh. I've seen tapeworms. You better cook your pork until it is done. Because how you get tapeworms is eating raw pork. Um, and so you can see the life cycle of it in your book. The tapeworm, the person eats the raw pork that's got the cyst, the tapeworm cyst in it. It goes to their intestines and it attaches itself. It grows into the tapeworm and eats the 
di the food from the host. So like there are a lot of Three Stooges skits from you know back a long time ago, and the the, the uh, Curly would order a restaurant. What do you want? And he says, Oh, just a a rotten egg and a piece of burnt toast, because I got a tapeworm and that's good enough for him. And so that, there used to be a lot more jokes about tapeworm in society if you watch those old movies. But then the person poops out part segments of the tape tapeworm and it breaks off in little pieces and then that ends up on the ground where the the pork um the the pig eats and he will eat part of the tapeworm and then that um will make the tapeworm leave the cyst in the pork and it goes from their intestines to their flesh so don't eat gross stuff like that yuck don't eat tapeworms. Anyway, so it's got a very interesting life cycle, though. So um, I used to work, before I became a teacher, I tried a lot of different majors and jobs. I started off as a chem major, and then I switched to biochem. And um, and and for, but before that, I thought about hospital, working in a hospital in the lab. And I did. I worked for... Um, at Anderson Memorial Hospital in, in South Carolina. And um, I worked in the lab and I saw tapeworms there in the lab. It was gross. Interesting things though. I saw tuberculosis. It glows under a black light. It's very interesting. So, um, but it was boring. I, I didn't like it. I'm glad there's people who do it, but I like teaching. I like that face-to-face -face contact and stuff. Even though I'm having to teach you guys because of the COVID that we started doing these um, YouTube classes, but I guess it's all going to work out, but I like the face-to-face -face of teaching students. Okay, so the next kind of worm um, with the flatworms is planaria, and you can see them on page 144. They have triangle-shaped heads and then a little body that's shaped like that that comes down. Um, they have th two things that are like eyes, but they're called eye spots because they're not as developed as real eyeballs, but they do detect light. And so uh, when I taught biology in public school, I ordered them and they're really cool and they'll respond to light and we did some labs with them and stuff, but you can take them and you can cut them and they will grow back. So you can take one and cut it down this way and it'll grow two new heads. You can cut it across the middle and each half will grow into a new whole one. So we wanted to do that when, we bought, when I bought them last time when I was teaching um, in public school and it, they just all died and, and they hardly lived through the lab. They like, they, we wanted to do all these things with them. So I never bought them again after that. And when I taught biology to homeschoolers, we just looked at the dead ones. I didn't bother with the live ones, but you should go online and look because it's really cool the way um, you can cut them in half and they'll grow new, new ends to them. So this, these simple life, a lot of them have, um, properties where they can regenerate, which is really cool, really interesting. I wish people had that. So, um, planaria characteristics, it has a flat body with muscles. It has a triangle head with eye spots. It has two nerve cords. It would be like if we had two spinal cords, one on each side of our body. That's what theirs is like. Um, the mouth is near the middle of the body, body. so it would be like if your belly button was your mouth still. That's weird. Um, they have an intestine that breaks down food, so you can see, and but still undigested food comes out the mouth. So you can see it's getting a little more complicated, but still mouth and anus, the same thing. Yep. Um, they have both, each animal is both male and female, and it produces both eggs and sperm. Um, they reproduce sexually by, by training sperm with another planaria, but they can also reproduce asexually because if you cut them in half, they'll each grow into a new animal. Very weird. So the next one are round worms, and these are tiny little round worms that are smooth and pointy on both ends, and if you hear that somebody got worms, this is what they got. It's gross. So these are parasites. <laughs> you don't want them. Uh, one kind is a hookworm. They are not, they are in the soil here in the southeastern United States, and you can get them by running around outside barefoot. So that's why your mama says, get on your shoes before you go outside. You don't want worms. Um, so they have 
long round bodies, they're tapered on both sides. They whip around to move, if you look at them under the microscope. Um, one end has a mouth, the other end has an anus. Finally, <laughs> an animal developed enough to have a separate anus. Good for it. Um, it has a tube in its body that connects its mouth and its anus. So it has a food tube, just like you. And um, mouth, food goes in the mouth and out the anus. Um, uh, the males and females are separate animals. So see, this is more advanced. It's a more advanced animal. The next kind of worm is what you think of when you think of worms, an earthworm or segmented worms. And so for your lab, you're, this week you're going to be doing a living lab with earthworms. You can buy them at Walmart in the sporting area. They sell worms, bait shops. You can go dig them up out of your yard. But let me warn you, one time we were, my family in our home school, we were doing a lab with worms. I'm like, I'm not going to buy worms. We're going to go dig them. We went out and started digging worms, and we were getting worms, and then we hit a yellow jacket's nest. We got stung so bad. So I haven't dug worms since then. I'm like, they sell those. I don't want to get stung. Me and my son, Nathan, ooh, we got stung all over because we got into the yellow jacket net, yellow jacket's nest digging worms for an experiment. Not even to go fishing, just for an experiment. Um, so the common earthworm is our segmented earthworm. It has a mouth and an anus. It has nerve cords. It has hearts. So we are, are much more complex. It has, notice I said hearts. It has multiple hearts. It has a brain. It's got a part for um, holding food and grinding food. It's kind of like a gizzard. Um, so it's got something kind of like teeth. It's got this hard part that can grind up its food. Um, it has a segment in body. It can move around. It's got little bristles that are kind of like um, little spikes that help it move along. Um, it's got blood vessels. It has an intestine. It's got an anus. Um, let's see, what else can we say about earthworms? Um, it has, oh, it had they all, but they all are both male and female. They have male and female, um, sex organs. They can reproduce when two worms exchange sperm. Um, some can self-fertilize. They can kind of fold themselves in half and fertilize, for, and self-fertilize. Earthworms are very important. They take in soil through their mouth and break it, get the food out of it, and then it goes out their anus. And it's very important for helping condition the soil. And so people buy them to put out their gardens and make it better. Now, my, um, my kids found in the garage this thing that's called the hammerhead worm. And it looks like a hammerhead shark, but it's a worm. And it was in the garage, and they're like, what in the world? They looked it up on Wikipedia, and they found out it is an invasive species that's supposed to be in Asia. It got here somehow, and it's killing worms. And it's very, very bad. So if you see a hammerhead worm, you need to kill it. Um, and I don't know what they did with it. I think they killed it because they, they wanted to see if it was like a slug, and they put salt on it because <laughs> that kills slugs if you put salt on them and they wanted to see if it did and it did um which we're going to talk about in a little bit so if you see one of those hammerhead worms kill it all right so your lab is on page 148 you're going to be doing this with living worms and there when i taught this lab uh um, last year to my biology classes uh, we did, I added to it, there are more things you can do with worms. So if you go online, you might can find some more, some extension things you can do with your earthworms. Um, some extra labs that we did. It was, it was really interesting. It was one of our best labs, was our living earthworm lab. So you should do it. I like when I teach biology. Biology is the study of life, not death. So I like living labs where we use living organisms and study them, not just dissection. Um, you can also get dissectables. You can dissect an earthworm and see all the parts. They sell the earthworms to dissect, the, the big ones where you can see all the, the guts really good at um, home science tools. They sell worms and frogs and everything else. So if you want dissectables for this class, I recommend you buy them from them. They're not real expensive, not if you're just buying one. And you can get some friends to come over and dissect with you. It's more fun. Just be real careful. The tools are sharp. It's easy to cut yourself. So if you're dissecting, um, be careful with it.
But if you want to dissect worms, now's the time to do it. This is the this is the worm chapter. We're talking about worms. You could go in the parts of the worms. So you could go ahead and dissect a worm now if you've got one. You could try dissecting one of your um, uh, live worms. You know, you could kill it and then dissect it. It's a worm. This kind of you know you kind of you take them fishing and usually the worm doesn't make it. Um, <laughs> so you know you could do that. But when you buy the ones from the biological companies, it's e they put stuff in, in it and on it where it's easier to find the little parts in it. Uh, when you do it, when it's just like a regular old worm, it, everything ends up kind of squished and harder to see and find. So the worms aren't real expensive. I bought them for the biology class last year. I thought... I think we dissected worms. We didn't get to do all the di di dissectables we were going to do because COVID hit and we didn't get together. We were all under quarantine and we couldn't get together. So um, we were not able to do all the dissections last year that I had planned. We were going to do frogs in the spring and some of the other things um, in the spring. We didn't. Everything shut down March 16th. So we didn't get to finish out what we were going to. Um so the next kind of animals is soft-bodied animals. These are your clams and stuff like that. Um, they have a thin fleshy tissue called a mantle. If they have a shell, the mantle secretes the shell and makes the shell. They have usually a foot for moving from place to place. Um, they have a head with a mouth. Um, they have a tongue with teeth that can scrape food off of surfaces. Um, the, a snail is one that has that. Um, some of them don't have shells. So, the classes of soft-bodied animals. Um, first look at the traits. The traits are in your book on page 151. They're all invertebrates. They do not have backbones. Um... Uh, they have a soft body that's covered by the mantle. Whether they have a shell or not, they still have a mantle. Most have one or two external shells or an internal shell. Some of these animals have a shell inside of them. It's like a bone, but just a shell. Um, a few have no shells, like the slug. And most have a foot by which they move about. Okay, so these are things like snails and, and slugs. Um, clams, mollusks, um, things like that. They are filter feeders. So they take in, they, these are um, like, like for the clams and oysters and scallops. They're fil filter feeders. They live in the ocean. They, their shell can open up and they can move around with their, their foot, sort of um, shaped like a shovel, and they use it to burrow in the sand. Um, shells have, uh, shells, snails have live on land or they can be in water um they put down a layer of slime to go on and um uh, they have tentacles and um they uh on the larger set of tentacles at the end are their sense organs like their eyes so in spongebob gary the snail you know how he has eyes on the end of his tentacles so it, it's funny because a lot of things in spongebob they took from reality which is interesting because the guy was like a marine biologist who did spongebob of course he took liberties but there are some certain things in that that are real that's kind of it's always funny when it is um, the snail has thousands of teeth on its tongue that it can, that scrapes food off of things with it. Um, we talked about the oysters. Next, you have octopus, squid, and cuttlefish. And they have, um, uh, they have their, sh both the squid and the cuttlefish have their shell inside their body. It's like a bone in them. Um, uh, octopus don't have one. That's why they can fit through really little things. And there's a really interesting story you can go look up. But in um, Finding Dory, not Finding Nemo, but Finding Dory, if you've seen this movie, not to spoil anything, but there is an octopus that is an escape artist and he gets out all the time. 
Um, that was based on a true story. You, you have to look it up, but and it wasn't just one octopus, but there's one in particular, but it's like three different octopus. They're very, very smart and they can, they're escape artists. So you'll have to look up the true story of the escaping octopus. Octopi? Octopus? Uh, if there's more than one, are they octopi? I don't know. Um, but anyway, uh, those things like the squid are the same as the jellyfish that they squish fluid out of their bodies, water out of their bodies, and the fluid goes one way, they go the other. Every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction is they, they swim up using Newton's first law of motion. Um, like let, blowing up a balloon and letting it go. Okay, is that it for this chapter? No, yes. That is it for this chapter. I was ready to talk about more animals. I think these animals are very interesting. I think the labs are very interesting. And um, I don't know if I told you in the last video, but I will repeat it. Um, there are 32 chapters in this book. We will probably not do every single one of them. A normal school year has 40 um, weeks. So there are a few more weeks than we have chapters. So if you find a chapter interesting and you want to do extra labs with it, you have time to do that. So don't feel like you just got boom, 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 do these every week. Um, we are going to do all of the chapters through 25. Um, not through 29, but we probably will not do uh, 30, 31, 32. So we're probably going to do 29 chapters. So I'm going to continue putting out the, the videos once a week. But um, you do not have to keep doing them once a week. You can spread it out because otherwise you'll be done with biology before the year's over. And maybe you want to do that. Um, but we will have completed biology. So... Um, uh, so anyway, just to bear that in mind, if you want to take a little more time, you know, take a little more time and dissect that worm or do extra labs, you have some time to do that because the school year is 40 weeks and we are probably only going to do 29 videos. So you've got some weeks in there where you can take two weeks for a chapter. All right. So science is great. Like, share, subscribe, and I'll see you next week.